Luke 11. Today we celebrate 60 years as a church. Happened on Friday is when we started, but the closest Sunday. It never ceases to amaze me how God orchestrates where we are in our study of his word to the occasion. In thinking about Anniversary Sunday, I thought, well, maybe I should preach a message just kind of specially, specially formulated for Anniversary Sunday. And I, I read here in Luke 11, and I thought, there it is. There it is. It's, it's what we would have been covering anyway. It's almost like God knew that we would be celebrating at this time. And, and it's kind of neat when God works that out. In our study of Luke today, we're going to be see the... The key of being used of God. What does it take to be used of God? What the lady's just saying about being real people. God uses real people because that's all there is, right? You, if you say, oh, this so-and-so, they're, they're, too, they're too, too special, too nice, too, too perfect to be used. No, you just don't know them well enough. God uses real people. God uses individuals. God can use families, and God can use churches. And we're going to see this morning what it takes for God to use an individual, a family, or a church. If the Lord tarries, an independent Bible church is still a vibrant force for righteousness in Wayland 60 years from now. I, I won't be the pastor, very likely, unless we make radical steps forward in medical technology. But it, if, if the Lord tarries for for unknown days to come, it'll be because, and we are continuing faithful, it'll be because we heed the message found here in Luke 11, verses 27 and following. In the first 13 verses of Luke 11, Jesus taught his followers to pray. In answer to their question in verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. He then casts out a demon only to have the religious leaders accuse him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, or Satan, right? And Jesus points out the, uh, the obvious logical problems with their argument. Why would Satan cast out Satan? That doesn't make any sense. A house divided against itself? Won't stand. Jesus points that out. He refutes this illogical statement, but he's interrupted. In verse 27, by a declaration of blessing. And it came to pass, as he, Jesus, spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. We're not given the identity of this woman. It only says she was a certain woman of the company. So we don't know who it was. It seems out of place, doesn't it? Jesus is talking, and all of a sudden she just raises her voice and makes this declaration. Who is, what's the name of the woman who gave birth to Jesus and who raised him as a child? Mary. Mary. We talked about her in, in Luke 1 and Luke 2. We, that's where we focused in on Mary and, and all, that, all that God did through her. Now Mary was blessed. There was something special about Mary. She's not holy. She's not the co-redemptress. She's, she's nothing of the sort. She's a sinner saved by the grace of her son. But Mary was special. In Luke chapter 1, verse 28, we read, And the angel, this is Gabriel, came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So this woman here in Luke 11 is only echoing what God himself had declared through the angel Gabriel in Luke 1. Blessed art thou among women. And this woman is making this statement, All women. In this day, around the time of Christ, all women, from the time when they knew that there would be a Messiah, all women daydreamed about being the mother of Messiah. Wouldn't that be something? To, to, to bear God's promised deliverer. All of, the, all of the Jewish women would have desired this. But this woman acknowledges, your mother, blessed is she among women. Essentially, what is she saying? She's saying... Your mother is blessed because of who you are. She's acknowledging the Messiahship of Christ. In this statement, she says, blessed is your mother, the woman who raised you, 
because of who you are. And so this woman's, this woman's statement of faith is given in verse 27. Jesus speaks in verse 28, and he doesn't contradict her. But he adds to what she said. What she said is true. The mother of Messiah was, in fact, blessed. Jesus says, but he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So Jesus accepts what she said. His mother was, in fact, blessed, Mary. But you want to be more blessed than even Mary? Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus had just talked about the, the futility of self-reformation. If you look back in verses 20 through 24 through 26, you see that's where the, the, the parable about the demon who left the man, and he got all of his act together, and then the demon came back with seven of his friends, and he was worse off in the end than he was in the beginning because he didn't have rebirth. He just had self-reformation. We're talking about this in Sunday school. You have to have Christ or it doesn't work. To, to try to win in the power of the flesh is futile. It won't work. It'll, it'll be a constant source of frustration to you if you're trying to accomplish in the flesh what was begun in the spirit. Jesus had talked about this, this futility of self-reformation. And now he kind of expands on that. A true follower of Christ is one who follows his word. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. John chapter 14 verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Which means if I don't keep his commandments, what is the, what is the logical other side? If I, if I don't keep his commandments, then I don't love him. Uh, one who hears the word of God, Jesus says here in verse 28, hey, blessed rather are they, the, they who hear the word of God and keep it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 3, verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby know we that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given, given us. Jesus makes a statement. You know it. This is not news to you. If you want to be blessed, keep his words. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The Bible says in James, this man, the doer of the word, shall be blessed in his deed or in his doing. You can, you can come to church and you can listen to all the messages you want. You can go home and you can listen to, to Christian radio and you can, can watch uh, good preachers, I hope, on, on television or online. And you can hear all of the Bible. But if you don't do it, it makes zero difference. So I spend, I spend probably, you know, I'm on the road a lot, so I spend probably 15 hours a week just, just listening to messages. Do you do them? Well, sometimes. Well, what good is it doing you? You say, well, I, I've got horrible sicknesses, but I spend a lot of time reading medical journals. <laughs> good. <laughs> What's it doing for you? Nothing. Not if you're not following what it says. Jesus says, look, my mother, certainly, she's blessed. Mary, the only woman for all time who gets to be the mother of Messiah. She's blessed. But Jesus says, moreover. The, the person who's, who's more happy, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Those who hear what God says and then, then apply it to their lives. Then he goes on and he's going to talk about the dangers of signs. Look at verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. The throng has returned. Jesus is packed in by people, as he always is. But, you know, from time to time he'll move, and it takes the throng of people a little while longer. They kind of, they kind of ooze on behind him. But now they've all gotten to where Jesus is, and they start to pack themselves in. 
And he began to say, when, when it says that, if you look there in verse 29, and he began to say, that is the equivalent in, in, in our modern English, it would be that he said it again. This is something that Jesus said regularly. You know that, that phrase that your dad said when you were growing up? And, and he said it a lot. You remember what it was? It's probably different for everybody, right? Jesus said this a lot. Jesus, this was something that was regular. Jesus talked about this, not just this once. He says it again. He began to say, meaning he, he says, and the disciples know where he's going. Jesus starts down this path, and the disciples know he's going to talk, he's going to talk about signs. Because apparently, it was something he did with some regularity. He said, as the crowd is coming in. Now, tell me this is a, is a health and wealth prosperity preacher. This is an evil generation. Does that sound like the, like the TV preachers with the great big smile and the $400 haircut? Yep. Does that? This is an evil generation. Just You can't say it with a smile, right? Jesus says it, and, and the whole crowd, they still keep coming. They're, they're still kind of oozing in from the outside. The crowd is all around. This is an evil generation. And everybody, everybody's ears perk up a little bit. Oh, why? <laughs> why are we an evil generation? Was the crowd that Jesus was speaking to largely Jews or largely Gentiles, given that he was in Judea? Largely Jews, okay? Because that was the majority population of the, of the country that he's in. So largely Jews. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus had a Jewish following. Jesus was consistently attacking Jewish tradition. And so Jesus' crowd would have been largely Jewish. That's not to say that there were no Gentiles. There might have been some. Some Samaritans could have been. The Jews had possessed the knowledge of God for many generations since the call of Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. When God said, get up from your country, from your family, and go to a place that I will tell you. That they had had an intimate, an intimate knowledge of God's ways and God's word and God's desires since then. Thousands of years that the Jews have known this is what God wants. They had the Old Testament. At this time, they'd have had the Old Testament. They'd have had it. Not everybody would have had a copy. But there would have been multiple copies that all of the people who were standing around Jesus could have heard on a regular basis had they so desired. They looked like they had a good understanding because the Jews, by and large, they, they tried to obey the commands of God. They tried to obey the oral traditions of the elders and the religious leaders. And they had constructed this this religious facade, not of genuine obedience, but of, of spiritual, spiritual fluff. And, and Jesus, remember, verse 28, blessed are those who, who hear the word of God and keep it. These people had heard the word of God, but they weren't keeping it. They just had kind of this, this false exterior. They looked like they had a good understanding of God's word, but... By and large, as a nation, we know that they didn't because they rejected Jesus, right? We know they didn't accept genuinely from the heart. And Jesus declares that the generation surrounding him was evil because they seek a sign. They seek a sign. Verse 16 of Luke 11 where we were just a couple weeks ago, says, And others tempting him saw of him a sign from heaven. You remember we talked about this? Was Jesus doing signs and wonders and miracles? Yeah. Consistently. Where Jesus went, lame people walked away and blind people walked away seeing. People who couldn't hear walked away and they were hearing those who were around them. Dead people got up. And walked away. Jesus was performing signs, but in verse 16 of Luke, of Luke 11, they wanted a bigger sign. We want something that's unmistakable. You know, Lord, Lord, do something that, that we can't deny. How could you deny the miracles that he was doing? Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, he said, We know that no man can do the things that you do except God be with him. Okay? So, 
It's not that they didn't have signs. Jesus was doing signs. They wanted something bigger. The word sign, the actual word, is a mark, a token. That by which a person or a thing is distinguished from others and is known. They want Jesus to do something huge. Like the, the parting of the Red Sea kind of a miracle. They want something like that. Again, I would argue that the raising of the dead is, is a pretty, pretty epic miracle. But in their case, they say, we want something bigger. You know, the, there's the Roman fortress of Antonio here in Jerusalem. Lord, take that and throw it into the Dead Sea. Then, then we'll be that type of a sign. We want something bigger. We want more lights. We want more, more uh, excitement. Behind your signs. The religious people surrounding Jesus didn't want to believe in him. Why? Well, they had lots of reasons. He was from Nazareth, not from Judea. You remember when, when the disciples found Jesus, they said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It's this little backwater up in Judea. <laughs> Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. They didn't want to believe in him because of where he was from. They didn't want to believe in him because of what he did. Jesus was the, the, the carpenter, right? For about 30 years. As he grew up, he was the, the craftsman. And, and not the religious elite. They, they had been scholars their whole life. You see, they were, they were the upper crust. And Jesus, he's just a common, he's just a common laborer. I don't know why he has this great big following. He didn't observe their customs either. You remember, they had some trouble over this. They said, well, why do your disciples eat with unwashing hands? Why do, you, why do you do this on the Sabbath? They have all of these questions. And Jesus had all of the answers. They had added to the law of God. And Jesus wasn't willing to go along with their facade. Jesus wasn't willing to fake it. And it made them uncomfortable. They say, well, we, we want a sign. We want to, if you give us a sign, then we'll believe. Essentially, they don't want to believe, and when you don't want to do something, any excuse will work, right? Right, gentlemen? Yeah. Yeah, any excuse will work when you don't want to do something. I found that to be the case. Honey, I can't do it because of the day of the week it is. You know, it, does, it doesn't have to make sense. What they're saying doesn't make sense. Again, Jesus is doing signs. And they said, we just need a bigger sign. Essentially, they're saying, we don't want to believe, so we're not going to. And that's how, they, that's how they're operating. So in looking for their excuse, they, they verbalize it by saying, if you expect us to believe in you, then you need to give us some unmistakable sign that what you've been saying is true. Again, but Jesus had performed miracles. These miracles were sufficient for someone who was looking at Christ honestly and from a pure heart. And Jesus was surrounded by lots of those people, too. There were many people who they said, this must be the Messiah. He raises the dead. He causes the blind to see. Have you heard what he says? He speaks with authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. He's, he's got to be the one. That's for people who have a genuine desire. That's for people who are honest. But the people who Jesus is talking about, they're an evil generation because they seek for a sign. They're looking for an excuse. Jesus told the disciples of John the Baptist. You remember in Luke chapter 7, they came and John was doubting. John said, are you the one we should look for or do we wait for another? And Jesus told the disciples of John in Luke 7, 22, tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see... The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And that was enough for John. Why? Because John was looking for truth. Where the generation, the crowd surrounding Jesus, at least at this time, for the most part, was not seeking truth. They were looking for an excuse, and they found one. He doesn't perform big enough miracles. If he performed bigger miracles, we'd believe in him. And Jesus says, this is an evil generation. Because they, they search for a son. Anyone with an open heart, an honest understanding of scripture would know who Jesus was. If they had read prophecy. Again, you remember when we talked about Simeon and Anna in the temple when Jesus was born? How did they know that it was time? Well, Jesus sent an angel and told them. But also, they studied 
they studied the scriptures. Any student of the Old Testament who, who could do math would be able to tell. It's about time for Messiah to, to be born. Any time now, Messiah could be born. And so those who were honestly looking would have known who Jesus was. But those who had a preconceived idea were looking for the sign. The sign that the self-righteous looked for was merely an excuse for their unbelief and rejection of the teachings and person of Christ. But Jesus says, I'll give you a sign. He's not going to give it to them today. But in, in verse 29 and 30, he talks about the ultimate sign. Jesus is not going to be their puppet. Jesus isn't going to do miracles and bigger miracles on command. Rather, he declares in the second part of verse 29, and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was, was a sign unto the Ninevites, so also shall the Son of Man be to this generation. Jesus declares, I'm not going to give you what you're looking for. I'm not, not going to do a bigger, a bigger, flashier miracle so that you can reject. He's not going to spell out the truth in the clouds. C could he have? Could he? Yeah, absolutely. He could have. He could have called. We sing the song. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He also could have called ten thousand angels to stand behind him and and echo what he was saying and lend credence. But he knows that they still wouldn't believe. He's not. He's not bringing the animal kingdom to declare the truth about him. He had opened a, a donkey's mouth in the Old Testament. Could Jesus have suddenly had all of the animals in Judea declaring the gospel? He could have done anything, but he doesn't. He says, I'm not giving you a sign, but I'll give you this. He'll give one undeniable sign to the naysayers and the disbelievers. It's the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, is a parallel passage to this that we're looking at here in Luke 11. And he says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You remember the story of Jonah? Jonas, here in the New Testament. Jonah, he was a prophet of God who was sent from Israel. He was called from Israel to go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians. <laughs> well, Jonah hated the Assyrians, and he said, I'm not going to the Assyrians. I'll go to Tarshish. So he went and bought a, bought a, a, a boat fare got on a boat and took off across the Mediterranean. Well, he couldn't hide from God. And God sent a great storm. The, the mariners who he was with eventually threw him over the side in answer to his request, and he was swallowed by a great fish. And the great fish swam around with him in the Mediterranean for three days and three nights. You want to talk about a long three days and three nights. You, you say, I've been, in, I've been in the hospital for three days and three nights. Well, try a whale's belly going around under the ocean. That's pretty rough. And he eventually is vomited back out onto, onto dry land. Again, a, a less than dignified process, I'm sure. As he's vomited out onto dry land, there have been men who, are, who, are, who have been swallowed by, by whales or, or, or giant animals at sea. And when it happens, when, when the few who have survived the occasion come out, they look different, okay? Very different. Okay? They probably have a faraway look in their eye most of the time while they're talking to you. But because of what they've been through, because of the digestive uh, tract of the, of the whale, they usually don't have any hair on their body. They're usually kind of bleached as a result of it. And, and here comes Jonah, okay? He, Probably didn't look like we saw him in the flannel graph or the children's books. He was kind of scary looking. When he walks into Nineveh, you've got this, this bald man with incredibly white skin and a weird look in his eye. And he keeps shouting, 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. You remember this? That's the story of Jonah. And, and for sake of time, we'll end there. Jesus says, I'm going to give this generation. This generation, the people who are standing around him now, I'll give you this sign. I'll give you the sign of the prophet Jonah. Just like he was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, the Son of Man, I, will be three days and three nights in the belly of the, uh, of the earth. And then what happened? The whale vomited Jonah out. What happened on the third day after Jesus had been in the grave? He, he walked out. 
he came out of the grave. What is the ultimate sign? The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. The sign of the prophet Jonas. He spent three days and three nights. He didn't die. He was alive the whole time. And then he came out. And it made a big impact on the people around him. Jesus is going to be crucified publicly. He's going to die publicly. And then he's going to be buried. And for three days and three nights, he'll abide in the grave. And then he'll come out. And it'll be the ultimate sign. This generation wants a sign. Here it is. You're going to kill me, and I'll rise again. Amen. The resurrection, the ultimate sign. But you know the rest of the story. You know what happens in the Gospels. Jesus does do just this. And we'll read about it when we get there. Jesus rose from the dead. Did this generation believe? I get proving what Jesus said. An evil generation looks for a sign. Jesus gave them the ultimate. He rose from the dead by his own power, and they still didn't believe him. They still didn't buy it. Proving his point. Again, when you're coming from a place of unbelief, the magnitude of the sign won't make any difference. So Jesus, continuing on here about these signs says there will be two judges from the past. Number one, there's the queen of Sheba. Look at verse 31. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. If you want to read the account of the queen of Sheba, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 10. She, the queen of Sheba, journeyed from what was likely the bottom of Arabia, it would be over a thousand miles in the days before mass transit and, and airplanes and such. So it was a long trip that she made to Jerusalem in order to hear the wisdom that Solomon spoke. She really wanted to hear what he had to say. Word of the wisdom of Solomon had reached her all the way there in, in Sheba. And one day, Jesus declares that she will stand in judgment of the generation to which he's speaking because... Number one, she had traveled a thousand miles to hear Solomon. Where did they have to go to hear truth? He was standing right there. She traveled a thousand miles, and they were in the very presence of one greater than Solomon. They were standing in the presence of Almighty Creator God, and they wouldn't hear him. She had traveled a thousand miles to hear mere man, and they had God in their midst. She'd have had no knowledge of the one true God prior to her engagement with Solomon, prior to her being with him. But the crowd surrounding Christ had the entire Old Testament. Is there enough in the Old Testament for you to understand the gospel? Yeah. And they, they all had it. They all had all the signs pointing to Jesus, and they rejected him. She traveled a thousand miles to hear a man. They had God in their midst. She ha didn't have the Old Testament. She didn't have anything except word of mouth. That This man, he's got wisdom. And she traveled. They had God speaking the words of God. She came uninvited. We don't have any record that Solomon sent and said, come, visit. And yet Jesus had said to those surrounding him, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. They had invitation. They had God in their midst. They had all of the Old Testament pointing to him, and they still rejected him. And as a result of that rejection, Jesus says, the Queen of Sheba one day will rise in judgment of this evil generation. Next, there's the men of Nineveh, the second judge, the group of judges. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The men of Nineveh. You remember Jonah with his altered appearance and faraway look. Walked into Nineveh crying, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And what did Nineveh do? They repented. They fell on their faces. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. Their king set aside his crown, his kingly robes, stepped out of the throne and put on sackcloth and repented before God for their evil. And Jonah was a childish, selfish, and extremely reluctant preacher. They have Jesus 
They have the Son of God speaking the Word of God, and they reject it. The Jews, who willingly reject Christ because he didn't fit their ideal, were rejecting one who was greater than Jonas. Jesus is making the point, you're looking for a sign, and here I am. Here I am, you've rejected me. The Queen of Sheba, she accepted me with less. She went to see Solomon. She went without invitation. She didn't have the Old Testament recorded for her like the Jews do. And she received the men of Nineveh. All they had was Jonah, and he was far from perfect a uh, preacher. And yet they repented, and yet here I stand, and you won't repent. And it's for those reasons that Jesus says, This, pointing around him, is a wicked generation, an evil generation, because they're looking for a sign. And the sign doesn't exist that would make them believe because they've already made up their minds. They don't want to believe. But Jesus says, I'll give you a sign. I'll, I'll come out of the grave. And they still didn't believe. They still reject. <clears throat> Jesus then is, is bringing this in for some application to his crowd, to those who do want to believe, to those who do hear him. He's bringing it in. He says, in this context, in verse 33, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. This is a, a physical illustration. Everybody knows what candles are. Everybody knows what you use them for. The purpose of a candle is to get light so that you can see. If you, if you, you ever walk in when it's really dark, and you don't have a light, it, it's rough. And Jesus is capitalizing on it. They have less ambient light than we do in our society. And Jesus is making this point. Look, you don't light candles and put them in, in the basement, which is what this, this translates to when he says that you don't, put a, you don't put it in the cellar. You don't put it in a secret place. If you think, i got to go into the <laughs> attic and i got to look for something. Okay, and your attic's dark, it's nighttime, you got to go into the attic to look for something, so you go turn on the light in the basement. <coughs> See? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? That's what Jesus is saying. Look, you don't light a candle and put it in the basement when you're not going to be in the basement, because it doesn't do any good. He says, neither do you, do you light it and put it under a basket. You say, well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to read, so I'm going to light my candle and then we'll put this basket over. No. no you're, you're negating the purpose of the candle. You light a candle... You place it in a prominent spot where the light will be visible to everybody who needs it. The purpose of the candle is to give illumination for what is to follow. Verse 34. Jesus is, keep, keep in mind what we just read in verse 33 about the candle, the light. He says, the light of the body is the eye. Meaning the way that light enters the body is the eye. If, if you light a candle... To go do your business and you close your eyes. You, you probably should go see someone about that, right? You, it's not going to do any good. The light of the eye, the, the light of the body is the eye. You light the candle, the light enters through your eye. It enables you to see. You close your eyes and you don't have light. Jesus says, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil... The body also is full of darkness. Just as a candle enables us to act with purpose and safety, our eyes are what enable our bodies to function appropriately. He says, when thine eye is single, the word single, the word haplos, meaning fulfilling its office. When the eye is single, meaning when it's open, if your eye is closed, it is not fulfilling its office. It's not doing what it was created to do. You're trying to do something. You walk in, your child's doing something, and they're making a mess. Maybe they're folding clothes, and they've got clothes everywhere. And you say, how are you doing? And they turn around like this, and they've got their eyes closed. You say, what are you doing? They say, I'm, I'm folding. You say, well, open your eyes so you can do what you're supposed to do. That's what Jesus is saying. If your eye is open, then your body will have light. But when the eye is evil, the word poneros, meaning hurtful, bad, or derelict, when your eye is diseased, or when your eye is closed, then thy whole body is full of darkness. 
When the eye is closed, you're not functioning properly. There are bigger problems. Now let's finish this thought before we get to the application. Look at verse 35. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. The problem with the religious Jews surrounding Christ was that they didn't know they were in darkness. They had their eyes closed, and they had talked themselves into the fact that they had all the light they needed. That I don't need Jesus, I've got Moses. I don't need Jesus, I've got tradition. And so they're standing there with their eyes closed, professing to see everything. And Jesus says, you won't see anything because your eyes are evil. Your eyes are closed. Jesus tells them to take heed. Beware. Consider. They needed to beware that what they perceived to be light, which they perceived the law, they perceived their tradition, their heritage, what they perceived to be light was not actually, or was, was not actually blinding them to what was in front of them. They were so tied up in the law of Moses that they refused to see the fulfillment of the law standing right in front of them. Verse 36, if thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. If the eyes are open, let's, let's take it out of, let's, let's give it all spiritual application. If your spiritual eyes are open and you're beholding the truth, truth with a capital T, you're beholding the the Son of God, then the whole body will be affected by the light that's received. The religious leaders, their eye was evil. Their eye was blinded to Jesus. They didn't understand. They didn't see who he was. The publicans and sinners, they looked at Jesus and they said, this has to be the Messiah. The religious leaders, the, the religious Jews, they thought, no. If he'd perform a bigger sign, we'd believe. They wanted a sign to prove who he was, but they had not received by faith because their spiritual eyes were darkened. The publicans, sinners and Gentiles, the commoners, Gentiles, that would be our, our folks, they were more receptive to the message and the light of Christ because they had an understanding of the darkness. They didn't believe that they were living in light when their eyes were in fact closed. By way of application, true blessing belongs to those not only who hear the word of God, but those who obey it. All of this goes together. If you, are, if you are in God's word with your eyes open, the eyes of faith, and you do what God says, James chapter 1 verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's God's word, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. True blessing comes to those who not only hear the word of God, but those who hear the word of God and obey it. You want to be blessed? This is it. The world was in the days of Christ, and it is still looking for excuses not to believe in who Jesus is. The world is looking for excuses to, to set aside the teachings of Christ, his word. They're looking for reasons to say, that's not the way. And the truth is, it's not for lack of evidence that they reject Christ, but because they've chosen to close their eyes to the truth. It's walking up to somebody with their eyes closed and, and saying, look at this. And they say, I am. You say, you're not. Your eyes are closed. They say, I am looking. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. You, you can't see because your eyes are closed. And the size of the sign won't make any difference to somebody whose eyes are closed. You're still missing the point. And that's exactly what they were doing in this day. But in light of the fact that men are closing their eyes to truth, they're intolerant of God's word. And they are. In our day and age, in the, in the culture in which we live, people are closed to God's word by and large. What should we do? Well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In a day when men don't want to receive the light, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 says, preach the word. That's not just for, not just for preachers, that's for all. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. What are we supposed to do in a world that's growing darker? Shine. Shine the light. That's what God wants us to do as individuals. As the day grows darker around us, as more men and women close their eyes to the truth of God, we are to shine as ambassadors for Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 says, That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebu rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. What does God want us to do as individuals in the midst of a darkening society? He wants us to shine the light of Christ. What does God want us to do as families in the midst of a, of a crooked and perverse generation? He wants us to shine as lights. There should be something markedly different about your family and mine. There should be something markedly different. What does God want us to do as a church? He wants us to shine. God, God has allowed Independent Bible Church to exist now for, for 60 years. And again, if God tarries and, and Independent Bible Church is here in another 60 years, and we're celebrating the 120th anniversary, if, if we will abide by his word, if we'll continue to shine, that then God will bless you remember in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus said, if you don't, then I'll come and I'll take away your candlestick. He, he was talking to churches. He was saying, if you don't abide by my words, if you don't, if you don't shine as you're supposed to, to the world around you, then you're, not, then you're not accomplishing the mission, and I'll take you away. God would have independent Bible church to shine on for him, not just now, not just for while, while we're all here, but we, we've got the children are downstairs. God would have that generation to shine on for him. God would have you to shine when you go out into the world. God would have you to shine on a regular basis. The, the size of the sign doesn't make a difference to people whose eyes are closed. But you and I shine a light to those who are genuinely searching. And God can do a work. And God wants to do a work in our midst. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. In just a minute, we're going to pray, and we'll, we'll carry on with the, the end of our service. But if you're sitting here this morning, and maybe there's one here this morning who you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. There's never been a time when you've accepted the light that he has shined, shined towards you. Today would be a great day to do that. But I know many of you, I know your testimonies, and I know that you have trusted Christ. Are you going to shine in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation? Are you going to shine in a dark, dark culture? Because God would have you to. That's why he left you here after he saved you. He saved you so that you could have fellowship with him, and he left you here so that you could help others to come to him, to shine that light. In just a moment, as we pray, you ask God, Lord, am I shining brightly, or does my... My wick need to be trimmed. Do I need to have more oil applied to, to my, my lamp so that I can shine on for you? Our Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we have so much given to us. Lord, as we, we talked this evening about the, or this morning about the Queen of Sheba, the men of Nineveh, they didn't have nearly what we have. And yet they made the effort to seek you out. Lord, I pray that our lives would be shining examples of what a Christian can and should be. Lord, you've said that if you're, you're lifted up, you'll draw all men unto yourself. I pray that you would be lifted up 
by us as individuals, as families, and as a church. Lord, I pray that we would each do whatever's necessary to, to trim up our, our candle so that we can shine brightly for you. In Jesus' name.